Let's see, next we have a 40 year old man with HIV and multiple skin lesions. Let me turn it the proper, proper side up. So just with that history, you probably right away imagine what this lesion is going to be. Yes. Since we're doing soft tissue, if we were doing derm path, it could be other things, but so what do you think this is? I was thinking Kaposi sarcoma. Yeah, Kaposi sarcoma, Kaposi sarcoma, however you like to however you like to say it. I'm not sure exactly the proper pronunciation. But yeah, right away from low power, we got some infiltrate in the dermis. And it's kind of patchy, variable cellularity, trickling all the way down here, okay? And multiple lesions in an HIV patient, never a good thing. It's, it could be capacity, especially if they're violaceous. Otherwise, you could think of cryptococcus or other types of infectious things, histoplasmosis that is disseminated, you know, depending on if they have uh, well, the, like full-blown AIDS or untreated HIV. So the, um, let's see the features here of capacity sarcoma. So capacity sarcoma can have variable features depending on the stage of the lesion. And the lesions kind of have three main phases from a clinical level, but they all do have different pathologic findings. Number one is patch stage. They're really thin, red to purple, but flat. Then they can get thicker and kind of become in a plaque-like stage. And then eventually they can become nodules. And sometimes the nodules, both either the early patch stage and the late nodular stage can be actually challenging to diagnose. The early stage can be challenging because it's super subtle and it can be very, very hard to find the few vessels and to recognize that they're even atypical uh, vessels. The um, nodule or tumor stage is hard to diagnose, not because you don't recognize that it's a tumor. You'll say, oh, that's a tumor, but you might not notice that it's capus sarcoma because it doesn't always have blood-filled spaces or the other features. But here, I think you kind of are seeing, this is kind of more like what plaque stage usually looks like over here, where there's a lot of dermal collagen left and there's infiltrating spindle cells and vascular channels between. Over here is kind of progressing towards what you'd see in a tumor stage um, capacity. So let's go down and look here. So these vessels up here might catch your eye at first, but most likely those are not actually tumor vessels. Those are probably, this is I don't know where this is on the body, but those are probably reactive dilated vessels or on the lower leg, it can be related to stasis. You can see vessels or it may just be reactive from the tumor. It's hard to know. Sometimes with the stain, um, you can tell. But this is one of the challenges here. Looking at this right away, you may not necessarily recognize that this is a vasco lesion, right? It's not right. super obvious vessel formation. But if you do an immunostain for CD34 or ERG, um, sometimes they can be CD31 negative for some strange reason. Um, they, the virus that, can, that, that causes this can downregulate CD31 expression, which is a strange thing. But they can be these spindle cells that are trickling through the dermis. And what you see instead of well-formed vascular channels, although sometimes you'll see that, a lot of times you see these little thin slit-like spaces, these little tiny spaces. And it, you, know, you can see crack-like artifact that looks like that a lot of times. So it can be challenging. But a couple clues that can help us out is if we see red blood cells in the spaces. If we see extravasated red blood cells, if we see hemosiderin, see that little pigment right there? Let's right. go closer for the video, pick it up. Hemosiderin, that means bleeding has been happening at some point and probably for a while, right? So there's a little touch of hemosiderin there. It's a little bit right there. Here's some red cells. And then these little globules, these are, these the classic teaching is that these are fragments of degenerated red blood cell that's being taken up by the tumor cell. I don't know if that's totally true, but people that are very smart and smarter than me have told me it's true. But I also see little little globules and droplets of proteinaceous material in a variety of other sarcomas, so I don't know. But in any case, these little droplets of pink stuff, whatever it may be, is supposed to be helpful. And one of my fellows, uh, Betsy Uhlenhake, um, she told me actually that these are called dwarf balls, D-O-R-F balls. And I did look it up and found like one obscure reference. And she was a, a very, very smart a uh, dermatologist uh, and knew all this esoterica. So I was like, wow, Betsy, that's amazing. So Betsy, if you're watching this, is a shout out to you. Um, in any case though, you know, areas like this, it can be really hard to tell them that there's vascular channels. Sometimes you can see little vacuoles. Some of those vacuoles can have red cells in them. So that's helpful. But um, the other thing that makes me, whenever I see trickly spindle cells in the dermis with any sign of hemorrhage, I always try to think of capacity, even without the history, because you don't always know that someone has AIDS. Sure. Also, you can see capacity in other settings. You can see it, particularly the, the time I probably see it most is in old people, right? Old people on the feet. And that's called the classic form of capacity. It was originally described in, in Mediterranean old men or Ashkenazi Jewish old men. But we recognize now old folks 
of any skin type or ethnicity can actually get it. It's as you get older, your immune system goes downhill and the virus, which is a relatively common virus, get, can overgrow and start producing this. And do you know what virus causes this tumor? HHV8. Yeah, human herpes virus H, HHV8. Exactly. And you can actually do a stain for that, HHV8. And there's another name for the stain, which I think it's always good to learn all the different stain names. It's called LANA1, L-A-N-A-1. It's something latent, something nuclear antigen. I guess I should probably memorize that at some point. But So in any case, it's really hard because this, this kind of cellular clumps of spindle cells don't really make good well-formed vessels. So um, one thing that I find helpful, though, is let me see if I can find it where if it's doing it in this case. One useful clue. Ah, there is this. For whatever reason, the spindled endothelial cells, because all the spindle cells you're seeing here, these are all endothelial cells. If you stain them with the vascular marker, they'll be positive. And that's one clue. When you see what you think are spindle cells, but they all stain like with ERG and 34, or if you're lucky with 31, then that's a clue that you're probably dealing with Kaposi sarcoma. And here, look what they've done. This is used to be a sweat gland, a sweat coil, an eccrine coil. See, that's a little tubule of it. There's tubules right, right there. They love to infiltrate and splay apart the eccrine coils. So if you have an eccrine coil in your biopsy and I see spindle cells or hemorrhage right around the eccrine coil, I'll often do an HHV8 just to be sure I'm not missing a subtle Kaposi sarcoma. And here, look at all the little red cells here. See, there's little tiny red cells everywhere here. So sometimes you can actually see nice little slit spaces where they float inside. Or if you cut the fascicle, because as these tumors progress, they become more fascicular. Let me see if I can show you that area. Sorry, there's so many pearls and I'm trying to like teach them all at once. Ah, here's actually a couple vascular channels. Look, that's probably, this is the kind of very primitive, immature, infiltrative channel right. of Kaposi. And um, that it can be very hard. Sometimes they do get more dilated and sometimes they'll wrap around. I mean, those could be tumor channels, actually. I might be, maybe I was wrong earlier when I told you they weren't. Because they do have kind of a little bit atypical looking endothelial cells. But um, sometimes they can actually make a, a little vessel that pushes into another vessel, and that's called the promontory sign. Like it makes like a little mound or a hill. But I feel like that's taught in books a lot, but you only rarely see it in real life, in my experience at least. So, uh, but as the as the lesions progress, they do become more spindled, and the spindle cells begin to sweep into fascicles. This one's not really doing it, but they're kind of a little bit of fascicle formation, and often in the more fascicle area you'll find little, the little spaces filled with blood. And, um, and then sometimes if you cut them, the fascicle and cross section, instead of little slit-like spaces, it'll be little holes. And Mark Edgar, um, one of my mentors, he taught me that that's like the sieve pattern or colander, like a spaghetti strainer, right. like all the little holes at the bottom filled with blood. Now you're never gonna want spaghetti again, <laughs> but it works. And this, this particular case doesn't have it, but I do have a couple Kaposi videos on my channel. And one of those has a real nice example of that. So anyway, this is a good case because it does show the range of features you can have. Here's a little bit of that. It's not real great, but you can see there's some little holes here that are filled with blood. But the reason is subtle. It is, there's no doubt it's a hard tumor sometimes, and it's really important to keep a high index of suspicion. The other thing is that they can make nice, well-formed, dilated channels sometimes. Sometimes it's very subtle, little crack-like, slit-like spaces. But other times they make channels that look infiltrative and can look like angiosarcoma. And telling angiosarcoma capacity is hugely important because capacity um, is basically not curable. It, if you have HIV and they treat the HIV, a lot of times the capacity will diminish or even go away as the HIV gets better and the immune system recovers, then the, uh, the HHV8 gets knocked down, okay? Um, but a lot of times they treat it like in older folks, they treat with palliation and it usually doesn't kill patients, although in uncontrolled AIDS it can, but oftentimes patients die with it rather than other. But it's not like you can go do a big surgery and cure it because it's a virus, right? right. And so it can be multifocal because the virus is all those places. When, when AIDS patients get multifocal lesions, it's not usually because they've had metastases all over their skin. It's because the virus is popping up and making these vessels proliferate in all those places. So a very strange tumor. It doesn't like grow and work the way that other cancers do. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a strange thing about it. Um, and then also, because, yeah, it's important to know that, that it's not managed by like wide, massive, aggressive surgery. Whereas angiosarcomas get heavy chemo sometimes, big surgeries, radiation, depending, very aggressive therapy, and often they're aggressive tumors. So the things that help me, if I see really prominent, like nasty atypia, that's going to make me worry about a spindled angiosarcoma, okay? And the other things, if I see something that looks like capacity in the head and neck of an old person, that's angiosarcoma until you prove to me with an HHV8 that it's actually Kaposi. Um, so that's a, a real important to make sure that to make that distinction. And now that we have the HHV8 stain, it's really easy to do because that stain is 
as close to 100% sensitive as you can, you can get. There are some other things that have HHV8, but in the vascular world, once you get a spindle thing like this, it's HHV8, you're dealing with Kaposi -E sarcoma, basically. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's a, a pretty good example of Kaposi -E sarcoma. All right, any questions about that? No. And it's a lot of, a lot of stuff to consider with this one. It is a, it's a tricky tumor. And I think it used to be really problematic in the old days, like in the, and by old days, I mean like the, the late 80s and early 90s, because before, before we had the HHVA stain, before we had um, therapy for HIV, young, a young person with Kaposi sarcoma, you're giving them AIDS, basically. I mean, people didn't get Kaposi sarcoma unless they had AIDS. And it was a terrifying, deadly disease that had no treatment at the time. So I never thought about that. And then some people who had been practicing at that time told me, and I thought, whoa, it just gave me this like moment of perspective of now it's a kind of a curiosity and we got an easy way to diagnose it. But back then telling Kaposi apart from other things was the difference between giving someone a deadly, uncurable disease, which is, you know, really terrible, obviously. So, so thankfully with heart, we often, I don't often see it in the setting of AIDS anymore, but occasionally we'll see like newly diagnosed patients that that kind of had delayed diagnosis. All right, so let's see.